Uh, good morning, anyone, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, some of the work that we did on uh, enabling a RISC-V microprocessor chip to communicate directly with photonic uh, inputs and outputs. And so, first of all, the motivation. Why did we do this? Um, if you look at the trends in microcore scaling, um, technology has done a lot to help us compute and fit more compute power on every single microchip, but it's not so much helped us move data in and out of microchips very easily. And if you look at the trend of microprocessors, we are going to be looking into regimes where we're sending out tens of terabits per data, tens of terabits per second of data. Now, one of the issues that you run into very quickly is the I.O. wall, in that, uh, one, you're power limited, meaning that you simply don't have the power budget of your chip to be able to move all that data that you want. And two, you're pin limited, in that you don't have enough electrical pins on your chip to move all the data at the rate you want to. So silicon photonics is a technology that's coming out that's being used to address this. And uh, this is very promising for overcoming a lot of these limitations, and so it's gotten a lot of interest from industry. But some of their approaches tend to be more conservative. And so one of the questions we asked was, how can we leverage silicon photonics to help with architecture? And so if you want to know uh, what are really the benefits of optical signaling versus electrical, uh, one, electrical signaling, you generally just do one signal per wire. Uh, in optical signaling, you can wavelength division multiplex. That is, put, multiple wave, put data on multiple wavelengths and multiplex them on a single fiber to get a lot more bandwidth per single connection. At the same time, uh, electrical links are distance limited, meaning they can't go very far before uh, you lose uh, your ability to detect the signal. And so optics allows you to go an arbitrary amount of distance. And so we asked the question, can this help, and how can we make this help with computer architecture? So six years ago, uh, Scott Beamer uh, and I, uh, we worked together and we proposed uh, kind of this monstrosity, uh, which is photonically connected memory. And I won't go into the details of this, but basically at a high level, what you set out to do was, if you can put photonics into a microprocessor, and you can put photonics to memory, you can basically scale up the memory capacity of your system and decouple that with the need to scale bandwidth. At the same time, you can also scale the bandwidth with your system and not also have the need to scale capacity. So a lot of benefits to getting the processor running into the tens of terabit regime. Little do we know that being naive grad students at the time, that about a year later, uh, we signed up for a DARPA project, and basically the DARPA project said, build this. Uh, and it's a huge undertaking, especially for a university. And so, uh, you know, as students, we kind of thought, well, what are, the, what are some of the interactions that you know, inter happen with the PIs and the project managers in order to enable this to happen? So I like to think that the conversation went something like this. So the program manager probably asked the PIs a lot of hard questions. The first question being, uh, photonics projects, you know, you need a dedicated process and a foundry for you to build your photonics. Where are you going to get the foundry from? Well, Professor Rajiv Ram in our project said, we can do it without a foundry. Uh, another tough question they probably asked was, you know, how about electronics? You have your photonics that you're building apparently without a foundry. Uh, where, are you going to get where are you going to get electronics from? How are you going to connect them together? Well, my advisor, Professor Vladimir Stoyanovic, said, we're going to build electronics on the same chip as we're going to build the photonics on. Uh, another tough question is, you know, optical links, you're always going to be competing against electrical links in the chip-to-chip -chip domain. How will your devices, how will you make your devices competitive given all these constraints? Well, no problem. Milos Popovich said, just leave that up to me. I'll solve this problem. And of course, the final question was, uh, where are you going to get your processor uh, that you're going to do in the system? And Krista said, hey, why not RISC-V? Um, and so, kind of many years later, uh, four years later, in fact, uh, we built it and we made this work. Um, and as Rick said, uh, this was published in Nature two weeks ago as the first microprocessor to communicate with light. Uh, we followed basically everything we set out to do in the DARPA program, meaning that we actually manufactured this in a standard commercial CMOS SOI process, so there's no need for us to develop our own process. It's a single chip with both electronics and optics. Uh, in the end, we are able to get very competitive com performance out of this. And the processor is a RISC-V core that's generated using the uh, rocket chip generator um, uh, from RISC-V. And so I want to show maybe the first minute uh, of this demo video we made.
This is the electronic photonic processor chip. This chip contains over 70 million electrical transistors and 850 integrated photonic devices. The chip floor plan is divided into several distinct regions. On the bottom of the chip, we have a dual-core RISC-V instruction set architecture processor. On the right side of the chip is a 1 megabyte memory array. The left side of the chip consists of the electronic photonic transceivers used by the processor and memory array, as well as independent test sites for photonics development. There are two sets of electronic photonic transceivers. One set is connected to the processor and the other set is connected to the 1 megabyte memory array. Each set has two transmitter banks and two receiver banks, with each bank containing 11 transmitter or receiver sites. There are hundreds of these sites across the chip, and the entire chip is 3 millimeters by 6 millimeters. Now to uh, understand a little bit more about what's on the chip and how we did it, here's kind of the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I realize many of you are not familiar with photonics, so I'll give a lightning fast introduction of what it is to build photonics in the CMOS process. I'll focus especially on the use of micro ring resonators as the active workhorse device. Um, after that, I'll complete the processor demonstration video uh, where we demonstrate actually the processor in our lab and I'll draw some conclusions uh, to conclude my talk. And so to understand how photonics works, uh, basically you have to look at how an optical fiber works. And basically all it is is uh, it uses the concept of total internal reflection to keep the light confined within the core of the fiber. Uh, they do this by having a lower index fiber, uh, fiber cladding surrounding a high index fiber core. And it's typically very low contrast between the two indices, so you need centimeter of bend radii to eliminate kind of bend losses from the fiber. Uh, now, you can take the same structure and build this uh, index contrast in a planar silicon platform. And so what this picture shows is a waveguide built with planar silicon processing. Uh, silicon is a high index material, so it serves uh, as a great waveguide core. And the oxides that are in kind of a, a silicon process can form the cladding for the material, and so to keep the light confined. Uh, you have very high index contrast with this, and so you can actually get bend radii on the order of a few microns. And this allows you to route light and build all sorts of optical structures on the chip. Now, if you take a look at this structure, this is actually, in fact, identical to the structure you have in a CMOS SOI process. And so the transistors that you, the silicon that you're, the crystalline silicon that you pattern to form your transistors, you can also pattern to form your waveguide structures and the waveguide cores. And in fact, that's what we did, uh, and we, that's how we got optics into this 45 nanometer SOI platform. One thing we did have to do uh, was, uh, because the buried oxide was not sufficiently thick in this process, we do have to do a substrate removal step to uh, remove the substrate of the chip after dye thinning uh, underneath the photonic regions. And this will allow us to use air cladding uh, so that we can guide light using these on-chip silicon structures. The transistors are actually not affected by the presence of a substrate or not, and so the substrate removal can be very, very coarse. Once you actually have your waveguide, uh, this actually gets you 90% of the way to having a photonics platform in the sense that the waveguides are being used for all your optical devices, and you have a way to route light anywhere you want to go on the chip. So what this chip looks like uh, as a packaged part is something like this. Uh, we have... Um, uh, basically a chip with several regions, and we only need to remove the substrate over the regions where there's actually photonic devices. Again, the removal could be done very coarsely because the electronics don't care if there's a substrate or not. And we keep the substrate over the processor and the memory bank so that we can contact the heat sink to it if we need to. So how we get data in and out of the signal is something like this. The electrical signals come out on the bottom of the chip. So this chip has been flip chip attached to an FR4 PCB, and so the electronic pins come out through the C4 ball outs that are coming out on the bottom of the chip. And because we did the substrate removal, we can actually access the optics from the back side of the chip uh, by positioning fibers over these sites where we have um, grading couplers. So to get light in and out of the chip and the device we use are these structures called the uh, fiber to waveguide couplers. What they are are they're just tiny optical micro antenna with a diffraction array. And so the waveguide comes in, hits this diffraction array, and it radiates some radiation pattern out of the chip. And you just have to match this radiation pattern with the radiation pattern that uh, can get into uh, that of an optical fiber. We can also do some tricks to it and use the polysilicon layer to build directionality in this, in that it only radiates in the direction where we're actually uh, trying to probe it with fibers and not anywhere else.
So now we have a way to get the light in and out of the chip and route it around the chip. Next is to actually do transmit and receive. And so the key workhorse device here is the device called the micro ring resonator. And what it is is just a waveguide wrapped in a loop uh, so that it resonates at a specific wavelength of light. It looks like an optical notch filter in the optical domain, and it's a very compact device with a bend radii of only a few microns. And it acts as a very high quality resonant notch filter. And so you can build modulators and detectors out of this. Um, basically for modulation, uh, you can do on-off keying by electrically shifting the resonant wavelength of the micro ring. And you should do that, uh, you use this effect called the carrier plasma dispersion effect, uh, which basically says that if we change the number of free carriers that are in the silicon waveguide, we can change the index of refraction and in turn change the resonant wavelength. And so if you move this resonant wavelength in and out of the laser wavelength, you create a way to do on-off keying uh, in a frequency wavelength selective way in that you're on only on-off keying a very specific wavelength of light. And so we are able to implement this transceiver on our platform. Uh, this micro ring is a five micron device. Uh, we can drive it directly with a CMOS logic converter. It only needs a, about a one volt swing. And we're able to scale the data rates uh, with our initial devices around two to five gig gigabits per second. Uh, later on, we are able to go up to uh, tens of gigabits per second. One thing to note is that the, uh, the energy efficiency of the device. You're driving a very, very tiny device with only a few femtofarads of capacitance. And so you're able to drive this device at a very, very low energy cost. Um, now, for the other side of the puzzle, uh, we have basically receivers. And uh, in order to do this wavelength selective receive, we also put a Ryko ring there. And what it does is, uh, for the wavelengths of light that are resonant at the resonant wavelength of the receiving ring, uh, it will pick it up and drop it off into a drop port photo detector. Uh, it'll pick it up and drop it off to, to a, a wide band photo detector on the drop port. Um, how we build the photo detector uh, is uh, we're able to leverage the existing silicon germanium that's in the process. So silicon doesn't absorb uh, infrared light at these wavelengths, but germanium does. And silicon germanium is a common material in modern processes that's being used to strain PMOS transistors. And so we're able to leverage that layer as an absorption material to make our photo detectors in. Uh, we're able to, using the on-chip circuits that are part of this platform, we're able to build receivers uh, with pretty good sensitivity and in uh, the tens of gigabits per second types of data rates per channel. And so once you have these micro rings, you can build these chip-to-chip uh, -chip wavelength division multiplex links uh, in that um, you, know, you use grading couplers to couple in light in and out of the chip with a fiber. You use a pair of matched resonators on the transmit and receive side for each optical wavelength channel you want to have. Um, and the high Q, the high selectivity of each of these micro ring resonators allows you to put multiple resonator channels, multiple wavelength channels on a single piece of fiber. And so this allows you to basically multiply up your data rate and to be able to push uh, many, many gigabits of data, gigabits per second, even terabits per second of data on a single optical fiber. And so there is one drawback I didn't mention for micro ring resonators is that as with many resonator devices, they're very sensitive to process and thermal variations. So this picture actually shows um, uh, some guys in Europe basically fabricating a bunch of these resonators and then uh, measuring where their resonance profiles are at. And you can see that just from the process variations, it's all over the place. Not only is it sensitive to process, it's also sensitive to temperature. And so you can thermally tune away these variations by changing the temperature, but it also opens up the problem that uh, in a system where the temperature is changing, uh, you need a way to actively stabilize the temperature of these resonators and do active stabilization. And so um, as I mentioned the issue, uh, one of the things you run into is, let's for example say you have a we have a micro ring on the receive side, and it's supposed to be picking up you know, laser at a specific optical channel, and the receiver gets some photo current that it sees and uh, you know, it works. But let's say that some active circuits turn on, the micro, ray, micro ring resonator heats up, the resonance moves, you suddenly see a drop in the amount of received photocurrent, and immediately your receiver starts experiencing bit errors. And so you need some sort of dynamic and active tracking. And so there's a bunch of ways to do this, uh, and I'll briefly talk about one of the ways. It's uh, active wavelength stabilization, active thermal tuning, using your on-chip circuits. And so you hook up 
you know, a low bandwidth receiver basically on the drop port of these rings to sense how much photo current you have. And based on how much photo current you're sensing versus how much uh, you set your reference photo current level to, uh, you can detect where the ring is uh, in the resonance relative to the wavelength of light you're trying to align at. And by doing this comparison, you're, doing, you're able to build a controller that does this. And if you embed a microheater within the ring itself, uh, you're basically able to complete a full temperature control loop uh, that's dependent on the amount of photocurrent that you're seeing. And so this is an active wavelength locking loop. And so this active wavelength transmitter and receiver we've also demonstrated and are also able to integrate on our chip. We get very high wavelength tunability. And the moment you do this, you now have a DWDM transmitter and receiver uh, that's not only uh, channel selective, but it's also tunable in terms of wavelength, meaning that you can position it wherever you want in terms of wavelength, and that's a very powerful thing. Um, and so we built the whole system out of this with a RISC-V processor and memory, and so we set up uh, this kind of testing framework. Um, basically, uh, we set up a processor to memory system in which a processor chip communicates to a chip that's set in memory mode, where we're only using its one megabyte bank, uh, through a set of optical links. And so the processor to memory link we're using to carry uh, commands to the memory as well as write data, and the memory to processor link, we're carrying the read data back from the memory. And to kind of give an overview of how this processor works, uh, when you load programs into the processor, the RISC-V binary file that runs on the processor will first get dropped into memory through the photonic links. Uh, once it's in memory, you reset the processor, and the processor begins execution at uh, some designated address and starts pulling instructions from memory as well as using that memory for uh, scratch space. And it's doing all of this through photonic links. And so now that you understand kind of how the system's set up, I'm going to show the rest of this demo video. This is the lab setup we use to demonstrate the optically connected memory system. There are two chip test stations in the setup, one hosting the chip acting as the processor and the other hosting the chip acting as the memory. Each test station has three fiber positioners to couple three fibers to the chip. One fiber brings in continuous wave laser light to couple into the transmit site. A second fiber couples light out of the output of the transmit site, and the third fiber couples light into a receive site. The chip is mounted on a chip board, which plugs into a socket on an adapter board. The adapter board plugs into the motherboard created using the control FPGA. A microscope overlooking the chip enables precise fiber positioning. The chipboard has a selective substrate removed chip mounted in the center. It provides all electrical connections to the chip, such as power and control signals. This picture shows a close-up with three fibers simultaneously coupled into the chip. A continuous wave laser source split 50-50 by a 1 to 2 splitter provides the optical power for links. The processor to memory link starts from one of the two outputs of the splitter, couples into and out of the processor chip to be modulated goes through an optical amplifier to be amplified, and couples into a receive site on the memory chip to be received. The memory to processor link starts from the other output of the splitter, couples into and out of the memory chip to be modulated, goes through an optical amplifier to be amplified, and couples into the processor chip to be received. This is another view of the setup. For the demonstration, we will be showing the screen from the computer we are using to control the demo. Before starting the demo, I'm going to first introduce what is on the screen. The bottom right shows a live picture of the processor chip under a microscope, zoomed in on a ring modulator transmitter. The microscope camera is somewhat sensitive to infrared wavelengths, so you can see a bit of a blue glow in places where there is light coming from the chip. The transmitter's thermal tuning control circuitry is locked on right now, so the ring resonator is aligned to the correct wavelength. You can see that there is a lot of power currently resonating in the ring from its blue glow. This black shadow here is an optical fiber positioned over a grating coupler to couple light out of the transmitter site. The bottom left screen is an interface that I use to configure the different components on the chip, and the top left of the screen is a terminal which I will use to run programs on the on-chip processor and to display its outputs. I have also launched a link monitoring window in the top right which plots the status of the processor to memory link in real time. This has information on the amount of power illuminating the modulator's drop port photo detector plotted on the green axis, the modulator's heater output power, 
plotted on the red axis, and the ratio of ones and zeros currently transmitted by the link, plotted on the blue axis. Now I am going to demonstrate the processor by running some test programs on it. The processor is capable of running arbitrary programs compiled to the RISC-V instruction set architecture. For all test programs that I am about to run, the processor uses its on-chip photonic transceivers to optically communicate to the memory bank on the other chip. The first test I am running is MemTest, which just uses the control FPGA to read and write every memory location in the remote memory bank through a direct memory access protocol. This verifies that we can optically access the memory bank and read out exactly the data values that we have written in. A bit error rate of zero here indicates that this is indeed the case. The next two tests are Hello World programs, which test that the processor can load a program from memory, execute its instructions, and print out text messages to the terminal. The two printouts shown here show that the test is successful. The next test is Stream, an application popular for benchmarking memory performance. This is a more stressful test, as there are a lot more program instructions, heavy use of memory, and many more terminal printouts. However, our processor completes it without any problems. Our final test is Teapot Renderer, which is an interactive graphical application where the processor performs pixel shading operations to render a 3D teapot based on the position and color of a light source. The teapot shown here in the top left is displaying the output of the processor. This is again a memory intensive application as the processor must read and write each pixel for the image in the frame buffer located in memory. Through keyboard inputs, I can also change the position of the light source as well as the color of the light source. Both actions cause the processor to render a new image to display. Now, this program is a lot of fun to play with for a while, but let's make things a bit more interesting. I'm going to use the microscope illuminator to change the amount of light shining on the chip, and thus changing the temperature of the chip. Watch the modulator's heater output power as I brighten and dim the illuminator. Under full illumination, which heats up the chip, the tuning controller lowers the heater power to the ring. Under zero illumination, which lets the chip cool to a lower temperature, the tuning controller increases the heater power to the ring. These actions keep the ring aligned to the laser wavelength and consequently to a constant temperature. As a result, the program works perfectly okay. This system is quite robust and I can basically do this forever without it breaking. Now, to show you what happens without thermal tuning, I'm going to use the configuration window to disable thermal tuning control. With thermal tuning control off, the heater power output is now constant and no longer adapts to the changing environment. Now watch what happens when I play with the illuminator. The corruption you see in the displayed image is a result of pixels being lost due to bit errors that occur in the link. And the program appears to have frozen up and crashed in a spectacular fashion. I should note that the illuminator only changes the chip temperature by about one degree, and even this small of a change is enough to cause the system to crash if thermal tuning is not turned on. This concludes the video, and I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, and so I guess uh, to wrap things up, um, this was the first processor chip to communicate directly uh, with the outside world using light. Um, part of the reason why we were able to build this was because we were able to design photonics in a standard CMOS process. And so we could reuse all of the infrastructure and all of the existing IP that's available in that process uh, to be able to build our devices. Uh, we've enabled the use of micro ring resonators through, uh, for transmitters and receivers uh, through active thermal tuning. And so that's one of the problems we had to solve to be able to enable these very compact devices that are on the chip. And so looking back on uh, the, some of the numbers we proposed at ISCA about five and a half, six years ago, and versus some of the numbers we're able to achieve now, uh, you know, puts things in a pretty good perspective in the sense that, hey, you know, some of the numbers that we're actually getting today out of the chips in the lab are actually pretty similar to what we proposed at ISCA uh, five years ago. And so this kind of just shows 
uh, how, um, with architecture, this is, we've kind of gone full circle. We proposed an architecture, we've gone out and built it, and we've gotten performance that's competitive to uh, what we built uh, and what we proposed in that architecture. Thank you all for your time and for listening to my talk. I, I want to thank the whole processor team. There's many of them to list at uh, MIT, CU Boulder, and of course UC Berkeley. Uh, special shout out to all the circuits and device designers uh, that are on this processor, as well as the RISC-V processor team for uh, all the software and for the actual processor itself. Uh, we also like to thank our sponsors and uh, feel free to contact me or, or feel free to ask questions and contact me later as well. Thank you. So that was, that was pretty cool. There's got to be a, at least one question. Um, so my question is, um, uh, so this is involving the processor interaction with external memory. Um, does the memory have a corresponding interface as well? And do you see this as um, a means of eliminating the need for caches going mm -hmm. forward? So the, the question was, uh, what is the memory chip that we connected to? And in the future, do you see this uh, as kind of a way to eliminate caches going forward? So the first part of the question is, um, we're really the only chip right now that speaks photonics. And so the actual other chip that we connect to is an identical copy of the same chip, but we are using kind of the, only the processor on one of the chips and only the one megabyte memory bank on the other chip. So it, it's the same chip, but we configure it in different modes, a memory mode and a processor mode. So the second part of the question is, uh, do you see this replacing caches moving forward? And so one of the things uh, that optics doesn't solve is, you know, regardless of where you're going, uh, whether you use optics or electrical, um, you're limited by the speed of light. And so if you're going very, very far, uh, you're still going to be hit by uh, memory latency. So you still want caches to be able to have something that's very low latency that you can talk to. Uh, where we see this having a benefit is especially with um, all the new uh, memory and storage hierarchies that are going out there today, where you have storage latencies on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds to microseconds, and you're basically able to uh, connect a lot of them to your processor uh, using this topology. Uh, and where, the, where you can tolerate slightly longer latencies in the interconnect to do so. Cool, thank you. So the, uh, Don Stark from Google. So the, the, um, the heater to keep the, the ring at the right temperature is a, is a really cool idea. Um, but from your presentation, it seems like you need to control the temperature of the transmitter, the receiver, to within like, you know, less than a degree C. So it's certainly possible to do that with a, you know, a small RISC-V processor, but how are you going to do that when the, the overall SOC is like a 10 watt or 100 watt uh, total design power envelope? It seems like your heater at that point needs to be really, really big. Yeah, so the, so the question is, uh, the heater, you've shown the heater working in a small system. How do you expect this to scale once you move up to a 10 watt or 100 watt uh, microprocessor? So that, that's a good question. Um, the heaters, because we do the kind of the substrate removal step, the heater tuning is actually very efficient. And so we're, um, I think the, the, the figure of merit number we use is, uh, it's about a milliwatt for every one, 1 1.2 to 1 1.5 nanometers of wavelength tuning. And so the heater that's currently on the chip pumps out about three milliwatts. So that corresponds to three or four nanometers, which actually corresponds to about 60 degrees C of temperature change. And so we, that's limited by just the fact that we're using a pretty high, resistive, pretty high resistance heater that's embedded in the micro ring. But you could also just use a, um, a, a less resistive heater if you want greater range. Another thing uh, that's been proposed is um, uh, because you're doing a DWDM link, um, you actually have wavelength channels that are fairly close to each other. And so if you wanted to save power, you don't actually have to tune your ring, the whole range of your temperature delta, to, of your temperature change. You can tune your ring to the nearest channel and do that assignment, basically, uh, dynamically. So you don't need the full heater tuning range. And so this is a, a way for um, heater power. To, we can do the heater power efficiently, and there are ways to scale the, the heater power for a much larger and power-hungry system. Sam, did you have a question over there? No? Uh, Tommy Flown on affiliated. What is the added latency of going uh, over the optical link? 
uh, added the latency? latency of latency of how oh, the end-to-end -end <coughs> latency. Yes. Yeah, so the end-to-end the -end latency in this case is actually dominated by just the length of the fiber. And so in our lab, if you, if you look at it, it's kind of messy. So it's pretty long spools of fiber going around. And so it's about a, I think it's about a 20 meter or a round trip latency. And so speed of light on 20 meters in a fiber is about uh, 100, 100 nanoseconds or so. So, so you have that latency plus um, a little bit for your CERTES, but that's also this, that's the same as uh, whether you have electrical or optical CERTES uh, anyways. Uh, second quick question, how, how fast can you switch channels? Uh, how fast can you switch, you mean for the, uh, for micro ring thermal tuning? So the, the switching of the channels, the micro rings here are on the order of microseconds. So the thermal time constant, you're limited by a thermal time constant there if you're tuning these micro rings thermally. And that's about uh, 13 microseconds for these rings that we have in the system. Um, one thing that's interesting that we have not looked at, but um, because these heaters are so highly tunable, you can actually do pre-emphasis of heaters to bring that latency down. Um, but I would imagine the channel to channel tuning is something you would do during kind of a, a downtime and not something you, you're constantly doing on a, on a nanosecond or per packet scale for, for these devices uh, we have today. Uh, Peter Shu, Oracle Labs. Um, so many people in industry anyway don't think of SOI as being a really commodity process. What's the prospect of this working on bulk CMOS? So, uh, so the question is what's the perspective of uh, the prospect of this working in bulk CMOS process. So actually, that's a good question. Um, as part of the DARPA project, we actually had to build both sides of the interface. And so we had to build the processor and we had to build the memory. Uh, the processor, we can go with SOI because it's high performance. The memory, actually, we had to do in bulk. And uh, we actually did that. Um, that was actually done in collaboration with Micron technology. And so we actually built the first uh, electro-optic monolithic electro-optic transceiver in a bulk process as well. There's a JSSC paper out uh, earlier last year from, uh, with, with me on it uh, that, uh, that, that describes that effort. And so a lot, parts of this approach do scale to bulk. Um, and one of the things that was nice was if you're using microring resonators, just because you have smaller devices, you can live with much higher, uh, much higher waveguide losses, and so you're less constrained in the process. Uh, of your photonics as well, and less constrained on how good your photonics need to be. But yeah, check out that paper if you're interested in, in the bulk work.